Today I would like to talk about an important topic, one that has had a lot of, let's call it bovine excrement laid around it. The topic of course is long swords and katanas. A lot of people know there are differences, obviously. A lot of people think that one sword is better than the other. I am not here to judge that. I have never fought with a katana, I have never trained in Japanese sword arts, so I am unfit to judge. I have, however, done a lot of research into how swords are made. And here I can provide some valuable insight, because this is the place where most of the misinterpretation happens. So let's talk about ore and how it got transferred into a sword. As you probably know, sword's primary chemical substance is iron. However, iron is mechanically not that terribly impressive, especially for something like swords. Um, as a matter of fact, bronze is a lot better for swords than iron is when cold worked. Uh, now, if you're wondering why they did iron swords instead of bronze swords all the time, is uh, because iron is cheap, bronze isn't. But the main thing is, iron can be made into steel. Steel is the super material for swords. There is no better material than steel for swords. However, making steel is a very tricky process, especially in the medieval times. You need a very specific amount of carbon. And I'm not talking about, let's say, 10%. I'm talking about 0.5% is the thing that you are after. So if you want to have good steel, you need to have in modern day standards, let's say from uh, 0.45 to 0.95% carbon. Yes, you can use other carbons, uh, higher carbons, if you want a really sharp sword, but it will be more brittle. That is the ideal that you want to have. Now, in the medieval ages, they had absolutely no chance of measuring how much carbon was in a certain sword or in a certain steel ingot. That isn't all. Iron ore is very dirty and you need to get rid of this dirt. This was usually done in a bloomery. So a bloomery produced a bloom, which is to say they put iron ore and they heated it up until the impurities, which henceforth shall be known as slag, uh, and the slag kind of oozed away because it has a lower melting point than iron does. Now, because they heated it with charcoal, the bloom also got some carbon in it, so it went through a process called carburization. This made pieces and bits of it into steel, but it wasn't very even, it wasn't homogenic. Uh, so you had pieces that were very good for swords and pieces that were not good for swords. Now for a while what they did was they broke down the bloom, they chose the best pieces, they uh, forge welded them together until they got a bar. But, as you can imagine, this is horrible. Uh, I don't mean horrible as in it makes bad results. It, makes, it gives good results, actually, but it's terribly difficult to do. It takes a lot of time, and the labor required is immense. The Japanese used this method for a long, long time, but I'll get back to that later. What the Europeans started doing is uh, they started actually smelting the ore, the iron ore, completely. Now... If you want good steel for swords, you need about 0.4 to 0.95 carbon content. That's in percent, so 0.4% to 0.95%. But once you melt down the iron, once it's in liquid form, it takes on carbon really quickly. So what you get is about 3 to 4%, maybe even 5 or 6, uh, of carbon in your iron which is terrible for swords, very brittle. This is called pig iron. And for a while, um, it was, actually it still is used for a lot of things, such as cooking pots, uh, but for swords, just no. It was never used for swords. It's very bad for swords. But what it doesn't have is slag. It has almost no slag in it because the iron is completely melted, the slag is melted, and they completely separate. So this would be great if only they could somehow get it to the right carbon levels. And they decarburized it almost completely first, uh, and then they slowly reheated it, slowly adding carbon content to it until they got uh, 
to about the right levels. And this is why you don't see folded swords in Europe. Now, this was a long process. This, what I'm talking about right now, was, let's say, finished in about the 15th century, late 15th century, let's say. And, of course, um, before that, they used other various ways of trying to carburize their iron. For example, they made a sword, uh, they put organic matter, and they heated the sword up, so what you got was a sword that had a, an outer layer of steel and an inner layer of soft iron. Sort of what the katanas were made of. So, the Japanese, they made katanas out of a steel called tamahagane, which I am sure you have heard of before. Tamahagane is, basically, it's part of a bloom, but their bloom was a bit different than, Euro uh, than Europeans' bloom were. For instance, it was about two tons heavy, so it was a huge-ass bloom. And because it was so big, it wasn't evenly carburized. The outsides had the best iron for swords, so let's say 1.0 to 1.2% carbon rating. Um, I know I said before that 0.95 is the max, but this is for modern standards. 1.0 to 1.2 would be great, especially because they also had a softer spine, which I'll get into later. However, um, out of this two-ton bloom that they had, Tamahagane was a very small part of it, and Tamahagane is considered to be the best steel to use for swords. So what they had to do is, they collected pieces of the tamahagane and they welded them together to get a tamahagane billet. And this was a lot of work. Of course, because this was a bloom, it contained a lot of impurities and they had to get rid of them. Which is how we get to actual forging. Here I'll start with the Japanese, because their forging was more complex. What they did was, when they had a billet of tamahagane, they used uh, usually, at least, not always, but they also used a lower uh, carbon level steel and then they folded these two together to even out the carbon so that you got, uh, let's say, 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 carbon. So this is called folding the steel. Um, it's not a Damascus. Damascus is a mono steel, so its um, carbon level throughout is absolutely the same. Uh, it does have a similar pattern, but it's, it comes from different uh, sources. With Damascus, it's because the surface forms a little bit of cementite, which then forms into patterns, um, like you can see here. And with the folded welding, what you get is a pattern more like this. Now, I'm sure you've heard that Europeans didn't fold their steel, which is, of course, false. Um, the Vikings did it a lot, and they produced some beautiful, beautiful results with it. Um, however, back to the Japanese. So once they forged uh, the billet from Tamahagane and forged another billet from a lower carbon steel and folded those two together, they started smithing out the sword. But we don't end it there yet. They also used iron or a very low carbon steel for the spine. So um, this is a process called laminating the steel, where when you fold it, you want to make a chemically single steel, so you don't want it to be any different. When you laminate the steel, you specifically want them to stay different, just be forged together. So what they did was, um, they usually used more than just two steels, but let's go with the simplest version, which is uh, just using the two steels. What they did was, the softer steel was used for the core, and the harder steel was usually wrapped around the core. They could also use, let's say, um, a medium carbon level steel to the sides, a very soft steel for the spine, and a very hard steel uh, for the edge. It really depends. The laminating they used could be rather complex. Now, when they forged all of this together, they were basically done with a forging process. The European forging was a lot simpler. You took the pure steel billet you had and you forged it into a sword. So with heat treatment, which is basically the most important part of a sword, at least for Euro European ones, I'll start with European blades. First, what you needed to do is heat the sword up to critical temperature. That's when the steel actually starts changing color. Um, the Japanese did this as well. They called it the serpent in the sword because the color changed. 
Um, and when it heats up to critical temperature, you want to put it in a quenching liquid. Now, at the start, because they weren't quite sure what they were doing, and because if you do a full quench, you get a very brittle sword, they only dipped it in and pulled it back out. Now, what this did is, because um, steel is a crystal, it forms crystal matrices. And because it forms crystal matrices that are very brittle and hard, if quenched fully, they didn't want that. They didn't want their swords breaking. Uh, so when they only uh, slack quenched it, so as I said before, dipped it in, took it out, uh, they got only a little bit of this very hard matrix and some of a not so hard matrix that was very resilient. But when they figured out that if you do a full quench and then reheat the sword to a moderate temperature for a longer time, let's say half an hour or an hour, and take it out, you will get a sword that has retained most of its hardness, so it holds a good edge, um, it is very flexible, and it is very, very resilient. Now, because they didn't have any timers back then, the way they usually would do this is by incantations, by basically spells. Um, when a good swordsmith found what works best, he made an incantation for it, and he passed that incantation uh, with the exact rhythm onto their apprentice. So this is um, where the legend of spell-forged swords comes from. So now for the Japanese. The Japanese also used the heating up to critical temperature, but first they coated their blades in clay. They didn't coat the whole blade uniformly, however. They left um, the edge with a lot less clay so that it retained its hardness. And when they did that, they heated, up, uh, they heated it up to critical temperature, then they quenched it. And sometimes even this was enough because they used so many different steels uh, that they didn't need to be afraid that it would break so often because they had a very soft spine. Usually, however, they still did a little bit of tempering just to improve the overall uh, properties, the mechanical properties of the sword. This is also how the katana gains its curvature. So when it goes into the tempering process, uh, I'm sorry, into the heat treating process, it's straight. But because the clay is applied unevenly, it bends. So it doesn't actually, uh, you don't actually need to forge a katana um, bent. You do it by proper heat treatment. Now for the differences in their forms. First off, katanas are very small swords. Their blade length is supposed to be 60 to 80 centimeters, which is quite short. For example, the average longsword in uh, the 15th century was 115 centimeters, uh, centimeters long with a 95 centimeter blade. So that's a 15 centimeter longer blade than the longer katanas they had. That's quite a lot, especially if you consider these are on the upper end of the katana blade length. Secondly, you will notice that the katana is obviously curved, the sword isn't, and the sword, um, the European sword, tapers, uh, usually tapers, a lot more acutely. Um, this isn't true of all European swords because there was so much variety, but usually they do have a more acute point than the katanas do. Thirdly, you'll notice there is a big difference in the crossguard. The katana has a much smaller crossguard, whereas the longsword has a bigger a more protective crossguard. Now, you might think that because the katana's crossguard is round, it protects your hand better, but it's too small to do that effectively, whereas uh, it's very easy to turn a cruciform crossguard so that it protects your hand very well. And lastly, um, when the Japanese swords don't have real pommels, they just have uh, caps at the end, um, the European swords do the blade actually passes all the way through the pommel and, and is pinned at the end. The handle on a European sword was usually just wooden leather, whereas the Japanese would use, uh, first off, wood, then some sort of um, ray skin, usually, or shark skin, and then they would um, use a cord to wrap it off so that you had a good grip. These are mostly all of the differences in the form. Oh yes, of course, the weight. The katana's average weight is around one kilogram, and um, the average weight for a longsword in the 15th century was 1.5 kilograms. The thing is, the katanas that weigh around a kilogram are mostly peacetime katanas. Wartime katanas 
were somewhat heavier to withstand the trials of combat. So let's say 1.2, I've even seen examples of katanas weighing up to 1.5 kilograms. The handle length is about the same, um, and handling wise, I can't comment sadly. I haven't played with many katanas. Uh, when I did hold them, they struck me as terribly short uh, compared to a longsword. Um, they didn't seem all that light because they have a very thick blade, um, a very thick uh, spine, so that they don't bend, obviously, and no pommel. Their point of balance is usually somewhat further down the blade than European swords is. Uh, I think that's it for the form. So that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed. I hope you have learned something new. And please stop arguing which sword is better. Now you know some more of the facts, some more of the factual differences, and hopefully you will yourself see that the swords are actually very, very similar. Just two different approaches taken to sword making. Thank you, and until next time, have a good one.